My name is Anna Kshmabusen. I'm the director of the Weiser Centers. Um, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you today Marek Belka, who is the president of the National Bank of Poland. And the breadth and depth of his political and economic experience is vast. Um, and it's all the more impressive because he has repeatedly served under very difficult circumstances um, with great deftness and accomplishment. He's widely, in respect, he's widely and deeply respected um, for both his expertise and skill and for his welcome, very welcome ability to step into and resolve crisis situations situations in both domestic and international politics. In Polish domestic, domestic politics, he has played an enormously important role, first serving as Deputy Prime Minister in 1997, the Minister of Finance from 2001 to 2, and the Prime Minister of Poland from 2004 to 2005, taking over and restoring stability after a period of conflict and political turmoil in the government. In the international arena, his record is equally distinguished. He has served as the Under Secretary General at the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the UN Economic wow. Commission for Europe. He was also an advisor to the World Bank, um, JP Morgan, and to the Prime Minister of Albania um, from 97 to 2001, after the near collapse of that country's political and economic structures. And finally, in 2003, he was asked to lead economic policy in the interim coalition administration of Iraq and asked to spearhead the economic rec recovery of Iraq. Most recently, before becoming the president of the Polish National Bank in June, he was the director of the IMF's European Department. And today, we are delighted and honored to welcome President Belka to the University of Michigan and to the Ronald and Eileen Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, and very much look forward to his speech entitled The European Dimension of the Global Crisis. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, the presentation that you'll see on the screen is for economists. But I understand that uh, not many, or not, not everybody here is economists. So uh, I will do the talking, which will slightly or occasionally divert from the text and use a less cryptic language. The topic is European dimension of the global crisis, and I thought that um, uh, it would be a, a bit boring if, if I concentrate only on Poland. Uh, on the contrary, I think that um, it's uh, interesting what is happening both in Europe as a whole, especially in the European Union, and then, or before this, in the region, in Central and Eastern Europe, which is sometimes called the post-transition part of Europe or emerging Europe, most of which is <coughs> is now within the, uh, the European Union. Uh, well, I'll start with uh, some very general statements about the crisis, uh, and I'm not going to go deeper into the origin and the causes of the crisis. Uh, it, what is important here is that it, it originated somewhere between the city of London and, uh, and the Wall Street, and yet uh, it hit European economy probably more uh, than, uh, than other parts of, uh, of the global economy, even the American economy, although recently the sentiment uh, uh, is changing so that Europe is seen in a more benign, um, sort of terms uh, and 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 more concern is is about the uh, the American economy. But generally, the the commentators, analysts, economists, politicians uh, point to three main causes of uh, of of the uh, crisis that uh, started somewhere in some some somewhere someone in 2007 and uh, well is or is not over yet uh, or at least it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, mutating into into different forms there are the three um, most frequently quoted uh, causes um, low interest rates in the U.S., uh, is the uh, more the most uh, sort of uh, uh, straightforward and simplistic, I would say, simplistic uh, explanation. Um, such economists like John Tyler, uh, the uh, John Tyler of the 
of Tyler Rule is uh, is the, mo the the main proponent of of this uh, uh, of this uh, theory. Global imbalances, basically meaning there are some countries which uh, uh, save too much and some that save too little or consume too much, and this. Uh, um, translates into uh, structural deficits or uh, or or, or um, surpluses on the current on the um, uh, uh, on the on the current account balance. Intermediation failure. This is the cryptic language the the economists use. It's about the uh, the inefficiency of the banking and financial systems. It's it's that. What they mean when they say intermediation failure is that, that this whole amount of savings or capital that was created somewhere or should be used somewhere else should be allocated according to the, uh, to the theory of efficient markets uh, in, a, in a proper, optimal way. And it was not. So the three probably played together to produce the situation that uh, bordered Mm, on a meltdown, on, on I venture to say on on a, the greatest uh, catastrophe in the history of uh, of uh, global economy. Well, this is uh, just a graph that shows these global imbalances. On the upper side, you have the different different countries or categories of countries that uh, that post. Uh, uh, surpluses on the uh, current account uh, and uh, and uh, below zero is those that uh, that are uh, that are structurally uh, that have structural deficits so in the upper side you see china and uh, and and germany japan you know all the usual suspects uh, oil producers in in the in the da uh, lower part you have uh, you have uh, uh, U.S. and others, and as you see, the the global imbalances should be treated as a sum of this upper and lower bound, uh, lower, uh, upper and lower uh, part of the uh, of the chart. So the, the the longer the chart, the bar. I'm sorry, the longer the bar, uh, the bigger the global imbalances are. And uh, as you see. Uh, they have re they have they have uh, fallen a bit uh, since the crisis, but they are st they are still quite uh, quite substantial. Uh, real short-term interest rates. This is the second uh, uh, the second uh, cause of the crisis that I mentioned. You know, remember this low interest rates. What we are really um, concerned about, we economists, is the low is the short-term real short-term interest rates. Short-term meaning re interest rate minus inflation. And here you see that United States uh, uh, had the interest, real interest rates consistently between zero and one. Uh, and and uh, Japan and the euro area uh, went even below zero uh, and remain, as a matter of, below zero. OK, so this is. Uh, a little bit uh, more about uh, about uh, this uh, crisis, crisis, the causes of crisis. Excess liquidity brought about by savings glut paves the way towards a falling risk aversion. Well, what it means is that you, when you have too much money and it's uh, very uh, cheap, then uh, you uh, tend to uh, actively look for high yields. Especially that uh, financial institutions are are obviously looking for higher profits in the short term, as short as possible, immediately every quarter. So so uh, so uh, then uh, you are looking for um, for for higher yields, for higher profits, and it happens so that the the uh, investment that yields higher profit are also more risky. Remember junk bonds, okay, and the ninja effect. The ninja effect is specific to the uh, to the American uh, subprime mortgage credit. You know what ninja means? No income, no job, neither assets, and still you get a, cre a credit. A credit 
uh, collateralized by the uh, uh, by the real by the piece of real estate by your home, and it's all hinged on the on the expectation that the prices of these real estate will go up and up and up and up, and it did for many decades, as a matter of fact, but it stopped. Uh, Greenspan put it's about the low interest rates, uh, basically engineered by the Federal Reserve uh, um, in in uh, in the early 2000s. A very loose and often fragmented financial supervision. Well, this is this is part of the problem. Uh, the banks and the shadow banks and the para banks and what have you were not uh, were not supervised, were not regulated, and then supervised. Um, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, uh, they were supervised from after the Great uh, Depression to uh, to the late seventies. But then the process of deregulation started, uh, which uh, which ended up in. Uh, uh, in in much less sketchy uh, regulation, uh, and also what uh, we sometimes call uh, a, a burst of uh, financial innovation. Financial innovation, innovation. This is a term that carries a positive connotation, of course. Yes. Well, n not necessarily. Some people say that the only real financial innovation that was worse. Worse, its its uh, its good reputation was the the ATM. Uh, the rest was uh, was not. That's probably an exaggeration, of course. But uh, I, I'm not going to go into this. Okay. So, what's the European dimension of it? It started in America, and it hit US. It 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 hit US. Yes, but then it hit Europe more than than it deserved. At least we thought so in Europe. Well, a, a crisis reveals vulnerabilities, weaknesses that are somehow covered up in, in good times. What were those, uh, those vulnerabilities, those weaknesses in Europe? Uh, well, this is a little bit of a history that uh, uh, when the subprime, subprime crisis um, occurred in mid-2007, uh, it generated a strong upward pressure on several European currencies. So, so the, the, the first reaction, OK, the, the US is in trouble, but not, in, in, not Europe. So the euro and other European currencies uh, strengthened. But then after Lehman, this tendency was reversed. Um, Maybe because the investors thought, oh my, this is really something close to a disaster, then we may look for a, for a, for a, for a safe haven. So, safe haven. Heaven, not necessarily. <laughs> safe haven. Uh, and uh, so the capital, the, the money f turned back to the US. Well, they called it. That it's high, it's 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 flight to quality. I I I never believed it. It was a flight to quality. It was flight to liquidity, because it 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 is, and it was, it is, and it will remain for years the biggest, the most liquid market, in which uh, you could easily dispose of your investment if if you wish to. So you fly to where it's easier to sell rather than you you. Then when you believe that the quality of investment is very high. But that is why the, the money flew from places like Poland, for example, which was never in danger. But it's much more difficult to, to sell uh, your, your financial instruments on the, on the Warsaw Stock Exchange or in Warsaw over the counter than, in, than in, at Wall Street. OK, so what were these vulnerabilities? What were these weaknesses? Uh, at the beginning, well, this is basically the again in a cryptic language, but this is the summary of this of the three vulnerabilities, three weaknesses that the European economy <coughs> displayed. Well, one was characteristic for Eastern Europe, for this emerging part of of the of the economy, like Poland, Hungary, the Baltic states, 
less so the Czech Republic. Czech Republic, and it's not only because Jan Schweinar is here, Czech Republic is absolutely exceptional. <laughs> and I'll say, I'll try to guess why. Uh, so what was the, the weakness of these, of these countries? Well, uh, they behaved in an exemplary way over the whole period of transition. They did right things. Uh, they uh, build up institutions. Uh, they uh, reformed, as we would say more generally. And, and they imported capital. As a matter of fact, according to all economic textbooks, capital should flow downhill, as we say. So from more advanced, richer countries to more to less advanced, poorer countries. Why? Well, because the, the profitability of investment in those latter group should be higher. So it's, it's all that we expected, that the money should flow from, say, Germany, France to Poland. And it did. And it did. Uh, but it should have happened, the same should have happened in other emerging regions, like uh, Asia, or Latin America? Well, of course, Africa. Nothing like this happened, however. In the run-up to the crisis in the, so before 2007, uh, the, the capital flew to the emerging Europe. But it went uphill from China, from Indonesia, from Korea to America. The same happened with Latin America and even and even in Africa with Af in Africa well just think of the oil producers so, so uh, raw materials producers in Africa they were uh, afloat with money and uh, instead of uh, spending it domestically to to develop infrastructure for example they invested this abroad of course for the no for the oil producers it's probably expected they should uh, invest most of their oil proceeds uh, abroad. So good thing happened, basically, that capital was flowing to these converging economies, to these economies that were catching up with their, with their uh, more affluent and more uh, developed neighbors in Western Europe. However, too much of a good thing is not good. Some of these countries became really addicted to, uh, to uh, Mm, to capital inflow. Um, the flip side of the capital inflow of capital inflows are current account deficits. And those grew to, 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 to levels that were unprecedented uh, in, in, in our history, in European history. 25% uh, current account deficit a year for a number of years happened in countries like Bulgaria or, or, or Latvia, Estonia. Yes, those countries grew at the rate of 10% for a number of years. The standard of living uh, increased. Uh, people started buying and building houses, apartments. You know, nothing like this happened in the history of Latvia or Estonia or, 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 or Bulgaria. But the problem was that one day, one day when bad time comes, those capital starts, stops flowing, and maybe even returns to, 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 the, to the home country. So this was the vulnerability of, uh, of, the, of the countries like Poland. Not really Poland. It didn't happen in Poland, happily, but, uh, but in most countries in the region. What, what was the story in Western Europe? Well, what was the vulnerability of Western Europe? Here, uh, you can see the story of unfinished convergence. Unfinished convergence, I would also add insufficient institutional framework behind the common currency. So suddenly, the strength of European economy, the euro, the common currency, became its weakness. Why so? Well, a joint currency, common currency in Europe, proved to be a great thing for many years for many countries. Why? Because it shielded them from uh, foreign exchange crisis and 
which which you know, was that haunted European economies uh, for years in the 70s and uh, in the 80s even and then suddenly you had this this umbrella of stability euro uh, which uh, provided uh, uh, maybe um, too much of, of complacency. No, complacency is always bad. Too much of, 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 of uh, calm uh, over the economy. And also, what turned out to be a weakness in this crisis is that euro as a common currency doesn't have a, a fiscal backup. What do I mean? You know, why is it that you want to have a currency? Well, for settlement reasons, I mean, payment reasons, of course, but also to be able to issue debt instruments in this currency. So the U.S. can issue treasury bonds, treasury bills, and sell them all over the world, borrowing money freely. But then those who buy treasury bonds uh, think of, well, when something happens, who will repay this, these debts? Who will buy this, re, repurchase these bonds? Well, it's the American taxpayer. I know that the American taxpayer is not the, 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 best, uh, the best partner to count on, but one day you will introduce VAT tax and everything will be rep repaid. <laughs> or not. But, um, but in the case of Europe, it's different. You don't have a European taxpayer. You have a German taxpayer. You have Greek taxpayer. And so on and so on. You have 27 taxpayers, or so 16. Now, with Estonia joining Euro in January, it will be 17 taxpayers. Uh, and it turned out that uh, the Bunds, the German uh, Euro-denominated uh, debt instruments, bonds, uh, were improperly priced almost the same, al al almost equally to the Euro-denominated uh, papers issued by the Greek governments. This was a market failure. The markets were somehow fooled into thinking that uh, that being a member of Euro uh, uh, basically guarantees uh, repayment. Uh, I will continue with this, but the, the real problem is that when you don't want to have a state and still a common currency, you have to agree on common fiscal policy, on common budget policy, on some coordination in this. Well, in the U.S., you have central budget. In, in the EU, you don't have. Well, what is called the European budget is one fortieth of what is needed. And it, this is spent o o only for the structural and cohesion funds for the new member states to uplift them. So instead, the Europeans uh, concluded a gentleman's agreement. They, uh, it's called the Maastricht Treaty, and they agreed that they will behave. They will not spend too much. They will not let the public deficit to grow over a certain uh, level. And they failed. It turned out that there were very few gentlemen in, in the European Union. Uh, well, so this was the I will I will return to it in a lighter way but so this this is this is the the problem in the in western europe okay and the third bullet point here is uk and iceland and possibly ireland and and and, and spain uh, they turned out to be a little bit like uh, like us uh, over leveraged as far as that is concerned, with too big a financial sector compared to its economy. Um, and all this burst, the bubble burst, and, and part of the economy of, of Ireland especially, or Spain, just disappeared. Ireland was banking, too many big banks for a small economy. Spain, 
too much construction uh, for the needs of the Spanish. They thought that uh, the population of, of Spain will grow and grow and grow, and all the Europeans in, in retirement will move to Spain to, uh, you know, to, to live better. But they overdid. So they were the, these were the weaknesses of Europe. So now we come back uh, to the Central and Eastern Europe, and basically you can you can look at the at the text. But I will just say the following: those some of those countries became almost addicted to capital inflows. Yes, they uh, tried to uh, to 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 defend or or to to uh, provide for uh, bigger reserves in time in 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 case of crisis. Like this, here you see uh, the upper uh, the upper side of uh, of this of this uh, chart. Uh, international reserves, or foreign reserves, were growing in different uh, regions. Also in, in emerging Europe, but only, but much less than in Latin America, uh, no, in Latin, in, in in Middle East and Asia. Uh, okay. Um, also, those countries started growing very fast. And when you when the economy grows very fast, then tax revenues also grow very fast. And then you are fooled into this, thinking it's going to be like this for eternity. And you start spending money also. So even if budget deficit, the headline budget deficit looked very good, as a matter of fact, some of these countries even had uh, budget surpluses like uh, like Bulgaria like Estonia some of them didn't have public debt at all Bulgaria until today has a uh, sort of public assets rather than public debt but it was not enough when the economy grew 10% a year and then the 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 capital stopped flowing Immediately, the whole construction, the, co the whole house of cards collapsed. And then, well, I was very much close to this. Uh, many of those countries, many of those countries, um, got to the IMF for for financing. Uh, it was uh, in most of these countries, the program was financed jointly by the EU and the IMF. Uh, and um, of course, what they had to say, what ha what they had to do is is, is simply to uh, to adjust uh, budgetary expenditures, uh, reforms, not so because they were reforming quite quite vigorously in the in 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 the past before the crisis, and and there was really little to do. Greece has to do more. Portugal has to do more. Spain has to do more, but not Latvia really, or even Bulgaria. These were properly reformed countries, but not properly managed in macroeconomic terms. And also, one, one, uh, one additional, one additional um, sort of comment on this: most of these countries were totally geared, if not obsessed, on euro adoption as soon as possible. Some of them had fixed exchange rates, currency board, which is the, the most stringent form of, of fixing the, the, the currency. Uh, you can say uh, Bulgaria and all three Baltic states had this, this arrangement, <coughs> more or less. I mean, Latvia is a slightly different case. But, but um, what it means that, number one, you don't have an option to devalue your, your, your currency when it's needed. Second, you have to be extremely careful with your fiscal policy because <coughs> you, I mean, you really cannot afford uh, having a, a pressure on your, on your, um, uh, on your currency. 
unless you have enormous reserves, which some of them had. But if you hoped for Euro accession soon, and you had um, inter, you had you had fixed exchange rate. What was the risk for Swedish banks, say, to channel money from Sweden to their subsidiaries in all these three countries and lend to consumers, to households, in euros at low in interest rates? At low interest rates, it seems risk-free. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, they thought, will be joining Euro in a matter of two, three years. There is no exchange rate risk because it was fixed. So there is no hell. We, we, we follow this, this business pattern basically without any, uh, any, any, any uh, risk, I mean perception of risk. <laughs> but then suddenly, it turned out that uh, uh, that these countries uh, had problems in, in refinancing the, their borrowing needs. Suddenly, this capital stopped flowing, and 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 the economy fell. You know, the, the economy contracted. Uh, those uh, high-growing economies contracted by altogether by about 20 percent. 15% in 2009 alone, and uh, uh, I mean, altogether it's about 20%. You may say, oh my God, if you grow 10% a year for five years, then if you have a correction of 20%, what is the problem? Well, there is a big problem, because if you get used to, <coughs> to the level of consumption, uh, but also you acquire debt that you have to repay, households, corporates. But um, I must say, and I mean, th that, that the Baltic states behaved really very courageously. Uh, Latvia, who went into crisis first, they, they got financing from international uh, financial institutions. It was not true that the IMF imposed a tough program on them. That's not true. It's on the reverse. They, they wanted to do more than the IMF had ever imagined of, uh, of requiring, of demanding. Th this, was, this was impossible. <clears throat> In one year, Latvia reduced their internal consumption by 40 percent, 4-0. In one year. Well, Ireland reduced its internal consumption by 20% in two years, which is also remarkable for a developed economy. The same is happening in Greece. So when crisis strikes, people can behave really, can, can sacrifice. And even, it turns out, they re-elect uh, politicians who, who, who uh, apply those measures on them. But if the people th are, are convinced that it is necessary and the people are honest, as they think about Valdis Dombrovskis in Latvia or Georgos Papandreou in Greece, they reelect these guys. It's a nice observation for 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 the for the political scientists. Uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, Romania, and uh, Czech Republic were the four countries that had floating interest rates, floating uh, exchange rates. So they could avail themselves of the, of, the, of the benefit of weaker currency in crisis. Did it help them? Yes, it helped Poland. It helped Czech Republic. It didn't help Romania and, and Hungary because the two countries uh, accumulated such imbalances in the, such, such fiscal imbalances that they were, they were deprived access to capital markets. One day, simply, the Romanians couldn't sell their bonds on the market. The same went for, for the Hungarians. And they had to, re, to, 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 to come to Washington, cap in hands, and, uh, and ask for money, or to Brussels. And they are now still not out of the woods. So having a, f a, a, a fixed, uh, a flexible exchange rate helps. But it's not enough. If you are irresponsible as far as fiscal policy con is concerned, uh, 
when crisis strikes, you fall into into a into a uh, into a, uh, a recession. Well, this shows you how the uh, how the um, exchange rate uh, of Polish zlot against euro, Swiss franc, and the U.S. dollar behaved. You see. There was a big appreciation uh, uh, in the run-up to the crisis. Then the SWOT uh, weakened uh, precipitously, but only for a very short period of time, and then rebounded. We are now again uh, in, a, in, a, in an appreciating, appreciating, appreciation, uh, uh, appreciation cycle. Uh, this is something that I... OK, then let's turn to euro area. I have already discussed some of these issues. I, th I, I observe, I made the observation that the financial markets uh, were wrong not to distinguish different countries uh, having different fiscal policies. They were fooled into thinking that Europe, Eurozone is one country, that this is a one fiscal policy. It was not. So the fiscal stability was phony. All of the sudden, this is the, probably the most important of all the, all of the sudden European sovereign bonds became a local toxic assets. Uh, most of, of, of European banks, it's not true probably, but we, we, we like to, to say so that they, they are free of subprime related assets. I don't believe it, you know, those smart guys from Goldman, when they wanted to dispose of some of this junk, they had to find that someone, you know, naive enough, and they almost uh, invariably found them on the Rhine. <laughs> yep. But by and large, European banks were free of, of those Toxic assets. Toxic? What does it mean, toxic? Well, you don't know how much it's worth, really. So you, you cannot really assess what, what is what uh, the, the value of those assets. And then suddenly it turned out that we have, we Europeans have our own toxic assets, which is Greek bonds, Portuguese bonds, Spanish bonds maybe, Irish bonds. What else? Because we don't know how much how uh, will they default? You know, you, you have followed this, this, this discussion. Will Greece default? What does it mean, really? Will Greece default? Uh, whether there will be some kind of debt restructuring. So if you hold a, um, a Greek bond, uh, is it worth 100% of the coupon, of the, of, the, of, the, of the face value, or is it uh, uh, worth 80% or maybe 50%? So this is, this is the problem. Of, of this toxic character. Well, having criticized the European uh, Union or the Eurozone, let me, let me just say that European integration still pays off. Uh, first, when the crisis struck, the countries were given liquidity from the European Central Bank. Uh, all the Eurozone countries were given liquidity, plus Denmark. Denmark was somehow treated as if they were in the Eurozone, not Poland, although we applied, and the Czech Republic, although they applied too. So we were told, hmm, you are different. We'll not forget about it. <laughs> But if the countries like Hungary and Romania and, and, um, uh, and Latvia needed money, they, uh, they could uh, use uh, a certain facility which, which was created many years ago in the, in the European Commission, which is called Balance of Payment Facility, BOP. It was supplemented by the fund, by the Europe International Monetary Fund. As a matter of fact, IMF gave about 60% uh, of, or 70% of, of what was needed. And they were not left alone. They were not left alone. <coughs> As a matter of fact, even those crisis countries in, in the East uh, didn't repeat the fate of, say, Thailand in 1997, 
or Mexico or, 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 or Argentina in uh, on many episodes in, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, what happened is that uh, those countries got help from their uh, more affluent brothers in the West. Second, the banks behaved differently from other episodes, crisis episodes uh, in, in the past. Uh, when the crisis struck in 1997, uh, foreign banks just, uh, just uh, left Thailand. But not even one single Western bank left uh, Ukraine even. That, that, is, that is going still through a really full-fledged banking crisis. Not even Ukraine. Uh, not not for not mentioning uh, any other any other crisis case so so all the western banks treated their investment in the region in the east uh, central and east european countries as long term as stable as profitable pers prospective domestic almost although i uh, um, I'm not sure whether this is a politically correct thing to say that Austrian banks uh, treat their investment in Hungary and Czech Republic as domestic investment. <laughs> but uh, but see, they do, but they do. And it's good, and it's good. We thought that they will drain liquidity from these countries, so use their subsidiaries uh, as, as conduits to, to channel money back to their headquarters, to their home markets where they needed this money. No, it didn't happen because uh, ECB provided huge amounts of quantity, all, quant all, all, all liquidity that was needed, simply. And there, there, were no, there was no, no, no reason uh, for, say, Raiffeisen Bank, uh, an Austrian bank that is very active in the, in the region, or Unicredit, uh, a, a huge Italian bank that is also present in every country in the region. They, they left the liquidity, left, left the money in those countries also because it, it brought higher profits. Uh, so, the, so in the short term, and I'm coming to the end, uh, it was, uh, it, the, the, the euro served as, a, as an umbrella, provided liquidity. But of course, It didn't prevent differentiation of, of cost of money. You see the upper, uh, the upper part of the graph, 10-year sovereign bond yields, which means how much a country has to pay for borrowing on the, on the markets long term. And you, you see this, this upper curve, it's Greece. So it went up to 9%. To and it stays like that. Uh, even even Ireland is now uh, paying more than Poland, which is not a euro euro country. However, what was exposed by the crisis is that the Europeans had to do something with the with their institutions. The Maastricht Treaty was conceived many years ago. It, uh, I called it a gentleman's agreement. They, uh, the countries simply committed to behave properly, but there were no sanctions. And a bad example came from the, from the uh, most important members, France and, uh, and Germany, in 2003. For both countries basically ignored Maastricht Treaty. Even if the economy was in good shape, they had budget deficits over the prescribed 3% threshold. So how can you really uh, be uh, tough with the Greeks? Well, the Greeks were really an exception because they failed on this account in every single year of Euro. Of Euro. So, so they never uh, succeeded in keeping their budget deficit below 3%. But uh, they didn't uh, care for regulating uh, their banks, the Europeans. The, the, one of the big uh, 
achievements of European integration is a full integration of, uh, of the fina financial market. You can, s you, can, you can set up a branch of your bank in any country of the European economic area. European economic area is the European Union plus Norway plus Iceland, which which is important in this case. And, 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 and it is regulated and supervised by the home country. Well, it's great in good times, but when a country, but, but when, when, when a bank goes, goes bust, who pays? Well, this is an unresolved issue. This is, I was already telling, this is the impact of the crisis, you see. In 2009, the contraction was 18% in Latvia, <laughs> some result. OK, so what was the response of the Europeans? First, even it was against the Maastricht Treaty, the European Treaty, as it is called, the European Treaty says it very clearly. There is no bailout for countries. And yet, the Europeans behaved in a practical way. They organized a bailout together with the IMF. 110 billion euro for a small country, immense. But the Greece is now forced to do what it didn't do in the last 20 years. What they're doing, they are cutting expenditure, they are reforming their economy, they are liberalizing the economy for the first time in years. Everything was regulated. Access to all occupations, all important occupations, was uh, uh, was was regulated, and the uh, the share of of, of state uh, ownership in infrastructure, especially, was basically 100 percent. Something like this would never could never happen in the new Europe, so to say. But Greece is a very old Europe. Now they have to catch up very very dramatically. What else they did? Well, OK, they, they set up this, this program for Greece, and yet the markets were still hysterical. And it was just, and the European Union f was on the brink of collapse. Because if the next country would be Portugal and Greece uh, and Spain, and suddenly the Greek, the, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese would be also denied access to the market, which means default. There is no money in the world to help Spain, or at least in Europe. Well, the finance ministers of all 27 countries convened in, um, in Brussels, and they agreed on, setting, on, on establishing a fund that, um, that is uh, 500 billion euro big plus the IMF committed 250 if needed, so it's altogether 750. And what is even more important, the European Central Bank, against all the rules that they have imposed on itself, which is not the case in the in Bank of England or with the Federal Reserve, they started buying sovereign <coughs> debt, which means Treasuries, treasury bonds of countries in distress. You know, we in Poland were taught by Western uh, advisors that this is something you can never do because this means printing money that will immediately lead to, uh, to inflation. OK, I'm not commenting about it. But they did it. And uh, well. It is how the economy, the, 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 the European economy was saved. But what, is really, what, what it really meant is that it was like a shot of morphine. I used this and I was criticized heavily because nobody knew what is shot of morphine. The morphine is given on, the, on, the, on your deathbed. I, 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 I thought that this shot of morphine was to the, for the markets, for the European financial markets. They were sort of given a shot of, of, of morphine to, to stabilize, not to go on with hysteria. Because it, they overreacted. They never reacted in the run up to the crisis. They, they mixed the Greek bonds with the German bonds. But then when the crisis hit, suddenly they, were, uh, they, become, they became very, very, very uh, sort of allergic to any kind of risk. 
So we have now a, a, a situation in which European Union is building, it's strengthening its fiscal policy. I'm not going to get into details. They are doing, well, they have decided not to build a state. That's the most important thing. Well, it, it's unrealistic. It's, it's unrealistic in Europe. They have decided, however, to strengthen the existing fiscal arrangements to make it more intrusive, uh, stronger surveillance, backed with some sanctions, and hopefully the gentlemen will now behave if they see that there is a, there is a stick uh, in the closet. Well, what for the... So, th this, is a, this is a watershed for the European Union. It, it may change the European Union. It may initiate a process of strengthening fiscal policy. It may strengthen the process of, of further integration. The problem is, what will happen for s in the Central and Eastern Europe? And I will say, I'll, I'll just say two things, and this is the last, the last two sentences of my, of my uh, lecture. Well, should they join Euro? This is the one, the question number one. If not, is there anything wrong with their business model so far? And what has to be changed? development model, convergence model, rather than business model. You say business models when you mean banks or, or corporate, uh, corporates, but not countries. But So is there something fundamentally wrong in these countries that, that they have to change? Well, number one, they, they have to remember capital inflows can be a trap. Too much of a good thing is not good. So they have to uh, rely on domestic resources, on domestic savings, more. They have to regulate the banks, even if the banks are in the hands of foreign uh, European banks, in a, in a tougher way, more, more closely. Many of those countries sort of neglected their usual early strengths in transition, that is, competitiveness in international markets. With this huge inflow of capital, they started losing competitiveness. And so countries like Latvia or Bulgaria grew only because of the non-tradable sectors. Non-tradable meaning financial services, real estate. And they have been losing market shares or not gaining market shares as they should, as they should in, in sort of traditional exports. Now they have to get back to this. So they have to, to sort of start again with reforms. Well, and they are not starting from scratch because many of those economies are very resilient, very flexible, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, they rebound quite nicely now in, in when, they when the recovery comes. Second, should they be obsessed with the European uh, with the European currency? Should they should they um, join the eurozone, acquire the the euro? <coughs> well, some of them have no choice. Those who have already fixed their currencies, like the Baltics and 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 Bulgaria, they have already uh, sort of paid the price of joining the euro. Now it's only the upside if they are allowed to enjoy the upside, like the Estonians did, like the Estonians are allowed to. So they have no, no, no reason to change their strategy. But Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, they have a choice. Well, theoretically, they have to join Euro because this is part of the accession treaty. But when, it's the matter of choice. So it can be in five years, in 10 years, in two years, whatever. Well, now, a little bit about Poland. When, when I am asked, are you for the Euro accession? I say, yes, I am for the Euro accession. Why? Well, let's start with political reason. When you are outside of the Eurozone, you are marginalized within the, Euros, with the Euro European Union. The decisions will be made in the Eurozone and applied to you, imposed on you. And you will not be at the table. And this is more and more evident that the European Union is 
moving into the double speed or two speed uh, uh, organization the inner circle is the european union uh, european monetary union or to be precise the eurozone uh, and 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 the others are decision takers so politically it is deadly to be outside of europe well what about economics well the euro is like a highway you know when you have a good car you can get the high to the highway and and drive uh, fast faster than on the country road but if your car is broken don't get there so what it, what does it mean you have to prepare yourself to 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 get to the euro what does it mean well you have to um, to close the gap with the more advanced countries you have to prepare uh, for fighting all the uh, bubbles that will immediately uh, show up when when you get to the euro suppose poland uh, embraces euro next year our interest rate the benchmark central bank interest rate is 3.5 Imagine what would happen if our interest rate is down to 1% as it is in the eurozone as of January. Well, it will be a boom, a great investment boom, consumption boom. That can we can we manage this? Well, that's the problem. The the Latvians didn't. So we could of course uh, compensate this for uh, by by very tough fiscal policy difficult by very tough regulatory and supervisory policy over the banks tough but possible uh, we can uh, compensate this uh, by very flexible labor markets which we have to an extent but not enough maybe so it has it has perils it has problems when something like this happens in a country that is still a catching up country it may become a trap it may become a trap so my re my uh, response to the question about euro is yes we want to get to the euro but uh, for the moment we have the comfort to to wait we have to put our fiscal house in order to reduce deficit second we have to wait until the eurozone itself puts its house in order i mean it is a little bit risky to get to the eurozone now and start paying the costs of bailout or possible bailout for Greece and others and the Slovaks were the first to pay the price so we take it easy which does not mean that we don't want to get to euro the only real long term argument for not getting to euro is political because the euro is necessarily a beginning of deeper integration i don't want to call it state but some elements of european states will be built around the common currency and if you hate it like some politicians in our countries do you should cons consistently be, gain be against it but if you don't hate it you should be for it so that's the the last thing that i want to say thank you very much questions. I'd like to thank President Belka for a wonderful talk and also thank Jan Schweiner and the International Policy Center at the Ford School for making this visit and this talk possible. So thank you very much. Okay, one, two, you know, it's, it's you should, you should, should, you should regulate the traffic, yes. Next year, regulate traffic. Okay. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, uh, just a couple real quick questions. Uh, what do you see uh, during these still volatile times, uh, and vis-a-vis -vis our country, the United States, uh, regarding a possible uh, financial uh, collapse uh, in the immediate or even within the next couple of years globally, uh, depression-wise? I don't want to use the word depression, but that's... That's what I'm looking at as far as what, are, what is the biggest threat to Europe uh, that you believe or, or the EU believes would be caused by U.S. policy? Well, the biggest problem in, in the global economy is how to 
reduce imbalances, global imbalances. So how to wind down this, this, this uh, surpluses and, and um, uh, deficits on the current account? So how to, um, how to mend the situation in which uh, uh, China is the producer of, uh, uh, of goods that are consumed by Americans and the Germans possibly are, uh, are, are, are um, delivering machinery to China so that the Chinese could, uh, could produce all those goodies for Americans, for, for those hungry Americans. And we and the Czechs are providing some, uh, you know, small parts to these machines uh, so that everything can go, uh, uh, go on and on. Well, th this, is, this is untenable, uh, and, and uh, well, one thing, well, and this, 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 this process has already begun. Well, first the Americans uh, started saving, saving, saving money, saving, I mean households, American households are, are saving money. Uh, so that even uh, some are, are worried that they, they are saving too much, that, so that the economy is uh, so slowing down. But the process has begun. Now the Chinese. Well, with the Chinese, there is this pressure on the China to revalue Yuan, which is part of the problem. But the sheer revaluation of yuan could help, but it will not do the, the, uh, do the trick, because what really is the, the reason of these imbalances is the, the growth model of China. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, have grown uh, you know, with a huge success. Basically, you know, 500 people were starving, and they are not starving. Now they are studying here, some of them. So, I mean, probably the biggest success in, in the history of mankind, the economic success. However, <coughs> such a change brings about consequences. Um, and of course, the internal structure of China is not uh, fully catching up with this economic success. China is still uh, basically uh, deprived of uh, uh, social security system to speak of, uh, modern health service to speak of. And also, I understand that, uh, that the demographic patterns have changed. So people have to save money for uh, rainy days, for health, for, uh, well, and, and one kid cannot take care of, 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 of the parents uh, as well as, I mean, so well as, as it was possible when they had five kids. So what has to change, it's the internal structure of the Chinese economy. And there is this tension between, say, China and, and the U.S., but the, 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 the strains are, are, are all over. And, and the Americans tell the Chinese, OK, devalue, I mean, revalue Yuan. And the Chinese tell them, no, it's a process. It will take years. We have already started this. And we, if we do something uh, you know, abrupt to our growth model, uh, will bring about a uh, huge uh, social unrest. You don't want the social unrest in China, do you? You don't. Okay. So, so this is one problem. It's behind. It's between the, the two the two big countries. But then, what? Where is Europe? Well, Europe is sort of officially not interested. We are not at war, at currency war, declared triche. But the but the but the the outcome would be uh, that the euro will, will get stronger. So, so yuan will not be uh, revalued, uh, uh, you know, against uh, against dollar, but uh, uh, it will be devalued against the uh, the euro. So, so, so yes, the dollar will get weaker, but not against the yuan, but against the euro. So, you, the, the, it's, it's the Europeans that would that could pay for it. So, this is one of the problems. Now, what is the problem for a country like us, like Poland? Well, if the Americans uh, care as they do about fiscal sustainability, as I understand the uh, Federal Reserve is, is worried about, so they get into this quantitative easing too, or whatever, they are printing money, they are providing liquidity. And even if Ben Bernanke says, no, this money is staying in, U in, the, in the US, it's not flowing out. Well. 
just think of all the pension funds in America. You know, they, they, they are starving for, for higher yields. And if only 1% of this money gets to Poland, as about 5% gets to Brazil, or maybe 6%, or maybe 10 this completely ruins the, the, uh, the, position, the competitive position of Brazil. So for emerging countries, the, the, con the, the negative consequence of, 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 uh, of the American uh, monetary policy is that uh, it's, it's, it's producing an attack on their currencies. So this, these are the immediate, uh, uh, the immediate dangers for, for European economy. But uh, you probably were asked about some sort of doomsday uh, scenarios, which I don't even think of. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Um, so, you know, great, great lecture. Um, let, me, let me continue on the previous question. So you talked about China. And, um, you know, in a way, uh, for us observing things from the distance, Poland is like a smaller China in that uh, China did not go into a, a recession when everybody else did, and Poland didn't either. In fact, uh, Poland was the only European country that did not go into uh, a recession. So can you tell us a little bit why? What's the magic uh, bullet there? And uh, is Poland bound to sort of restart faster now, like China is growing very fast and in some sense pulling Germany? and, and everybody else. And then the second question relates then to the euro. Given that Poland and these other centuries European countries are such open economies, uh, you, in my view, haven't been putting much emphasis on the fact that the major fluctuation in currencies, so Zloty in Poland and Czech Crown and others vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the euro, makes it very difficult for companies uh, to plan and withstand. I mean, there is easily 20 percent move in one direction versus another, so it sort of completely swamps other things. Hedging is costly, so it's difficult for them. So wouldn't that be an argument to enter faster rather than sooner the Eurozone? Faster, sooner rather than slower, sorry. Well, let me start with the second question. Yes, it, it's, it's definitely an argument. However, when we look at the 20 years of transition, and I'm talking about Poland more than the Czech Republic, the, one of the big differences between the the two countries is that um, uh, you know when when you think about the early uh, reform package of Balcerovich, it was I mean it's considered to be a big bang, yes, but it was a big bang as far as the real economy is concerned. There was no big bang as far as disinflation was concerned. Inflation was still about ten percent in two thousand, no, in nineteen ninety nine. So the disinflation took very long, which, of course, uh, resulted in inflationary expectations to be much more deeply rooted in Poland than in the Czech Republic. OK, it, it may go to the days of command economy and communism. Where, I mean, Czech economy was stagnant but stable. Polish economy was uh, unstable, destabilized, destabilized periodically, and, and uh, so that it was the, the, the worst of all world, worlds. Uh, so coming back, yes, uh, the volatility of uh, of the of the uh, currency is is an argument to to join euro, uh, and we thought that złoty is doomed to appreciate, and yes, it did appreciate. Either really, really means that uh, the inflation is higher than than say in 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 the reference area, which is the eurozone or Western Europe, uh, or nominally, which is what you see at the, at the counter. So <coughs> it did appreciate up to about 2004. When we, when we joined the euro, we thought, my, now the, the, the Zwati will really sort of strengthen unbearably. It didn't happen so. Yes, there is a lot of fluctuation, but the nominal interest rate in Poland now is about the same or almost the same as at the day of, of, of uh, Euro ex EU accession. 
and uh, the inflation rate was only slightly, slightly higher. So we didn't lose uh, our competitive competitiveness at all. And with all the you know higher productivity growth, we are, as a matter of fact, um, uh, gaining in uh, in market shares. But yes, <clears throat> uh, what we are uh, terrified with is is the uh, volatility of currency. That is why we are afraid of getting into ERM two because we saw we think that when we are when you are in this ERM two, it's it's a two years waiting period in which you have to stabilize your currency before joining euro in the range of minus plus fifteen percent. When you get into something like this, all the speculators of the world are will be flocking in and try to play on this. As long as we abstain for setting any any band, any target rate, it's dif it's difficult to speculate. So yes, this is something that that we are uh, taking into consideration. But um, well. So far, it's a non-issue. The Minister of Finance is struggling with the budget deficit of close to 8%. Second question is, why did Poland avoid a recession? Oh, many reasons, many reasons. Um, well, first, I think that uh, we are less open with bigger internal market. Bigger internal, the internal market was carried by, by consumption, which uh, which didn't uh, really uh, uh, fell, which didn't fall at all, never. Why? Well, two reasons. Uh, there was very little labor shedding, if at all, contrary to the episode uh, from 1999-2001. We had a slowdown, and there was a huge increase in unemployment there. Now the corporates didn't do it. They were afraid of doing this because of the cost of rehiring. Second, well, Poland was the country that applied fiscal stimulus two years before the crisis happened. And it was a complete nonsense, macroeconomic nonsense, but it is exactly what happened in, in the years 2006 and 7, and it was uh, you know, enacted in, in uh, one year later. Uh, the uh, the government uh, reduced both personal income taxes and uh, social security contributions 2.5% of gdp worth so we had a fiscal stimulus 2.5% of gdp which translated into stable consumption of course now we have a big problem what to do with this because it created a structural type of deficit uh, so this tells you that fiscal policy can be very sort of powerful, but also completely useless. Because you have to have this perfect foresight that Mr. Kaczynski had when he was the prime minister mm -hmm. to impose this, to impose, to reduce taxation. Uh, because he, well, of course, I'm joking. I mean, th this was just purely by chance. But there were also some uh, some other factors. Zwoty was flexible, so it fell. You you saw the the graph, which shielded exporters completely from from any reduction of of profits in Zwoty. Um, so you can go with this list. But let me tell you, Poland survived. The, the the crisis as Czech Republic rebounded nicely so as 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 did Slovakia after one year just of a of a export uh, led blip because all these countries build up decent institutions uh, people believe in stability of their currency uh, Poland maybe contrary to other countries, have a reasonably deep financial market where it can satisfy about 80% of its public borrowing needs with very little recourse to international markets. And most important, Poland is really successful in developing entrepreneurial uh, class. I mean, unpres un unparalleled with in, in the region. And this is helpful. These people care for themselves. They, are, they cannot be uh, fired from their uh, companies because they are bosses. 
many of them developed the, 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 their businesses uh, uh, to a medium uh, size uh, export businesses. They sell goods uh, to the European market. Uh, so our exports is not only export uh, of international companies, and we are not only part of this international uh, distribution channels, uh, we chains. We, we are also exporters of final goods. So all this added up uh, to, uh, to a good performance. And I think it, we are poised to, to grow uh, nicely over the years. Of course, uh, a slowdown in Western Europe uh, will not help, but uh, I'm I'm not worried uh, so much. What is the view from Europe of the dollar as the global reserve? as the global reserve currency there's some talk about you know this kind of introducing certain burden uh, well this is both a, a blessing and a curse for the american economy but what's your view of mostly this? a blessing i would say what, what's your view of this uh you know uh from european perspective <coughs> Well, if there is a change, it's only gradual because you know I don't believe in uh, in 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 a in a mandated uh, change uh, uh, in the system. Well, you know, imposed by the IMF that okay, guys, now from now on we'll introduce SDRs. You know, whatever. <laughs> now this this doesn't make sense because the SDR is not not marketable. There is no market for SDRs. The only market maker is 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 IMF so far. However. Uh, why shouldn't uh, the yuan or rupee or or real be also traded internationally? Well, I, but but I think it's it it the, sh the will should come from from these countries. Um, well, I, I don't know. This is this is this is this is uh, nobody's view. It's just my speculation. What would happen if if the uh, if the Chinese would tell Americans, okay, we are going to lend you money, but uh, you won. So, so please uh, issue uh, treasury, treasury bonds denominated in yuan. Love? Laughter? It's, it's, un, it's unfound. It's a, I mean, there, is, there is nothing funny in this. That would reduce the pressure for... You want appreciation, appreciation, of course, right. of course, of course, yeah. of course. This would be a, you know, one way to circumvent this pressure. The U.S. would never allow that. The the U.S. will have no say. <laughs> Sorry, because it's the Chinese who can dictate uh, who can dictate the uh, the conditions. One day, at least. If the thing goes as they go now, the Chinese one day will say, okay, fine, but buy, uh, but issue bonds in yuan. Why not? And then, from this moment on, yuan will start being an international currency. We have time for one final question. It's about the yuan now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I liked what you said earlier about uh, the idea that, like, the Baltic states, you said, be behaved heroically when they uh, were able to reduce their internal consumption by as much as, like, 40% in one year. But I guess Latvia, my, yes. But I guess my question is, is um, how much of that is, like, heroic behavior versus the idea that their spending was just, like, so egregiously poor and out of control that this was just a correction back <laughs> to, like, something that was vaguely normal? Yeah, yeah, very sobering remark. Of course, of course, this forty uh, percent uh, reduction would not be would not be possible if uh, if it were not in a special situation. The the um, uh, the crisis in in these countries uh, was was preceded by by exuberance, 
and and the people there uh, didn't yet get used to the idea that they were sort of so affluent. So so they it was easy for them to to uh, to get back to the, to where they were, let's say two three years ago. But you know, also when I when I talk to the Latvians, and we were we we're very unhappy about what what we had to do we in the at the IMF with Latvia, and we didn't have trust in Latvia to a certain point. Uh, we we thought that the country will collapse simply, <coughs> and we discussed the. Uh, these issues with the Latvians, and how can you, can you, can you survive such a crisis? And and then the Latvians said, well, what crisis? Come on, don't, don't exaggerate. I mean, we had a crisis in the, in the memory of the Latvians. The crisis was, was when when the people were sent to Siberia by the Soviets. This was a crisis. Now it's just uh, well a correction. <laughs> you know, this is the problem with the Greeks that they don't have such a memory. <laughs> But they are doing considerably well. They are doing well. You know, the media are obviously projecting on us those those uh, pictures from the streets of Athens. But this is a margin. As a matter of fact, the the people in Greece are accepting reforms. Papandreou is is uh, popular, and and all those trackers or what have you, I mean, regulated over professions. They they are not enjoying support of the of the population. I mean of the of the majority of the population. So when you have to do heroic things, you do heroic things. Uh, but you are right. What happened in in Latvia is 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 a special conjuncture of of, of uh, events. Uh, yeah, what happened was not real. So now they are back in real. On that optimistic but pragmatic note, thank you very much. Thank you.